thank you so much for joining us tonight for this very important and timely conversation, the importance of HBCUs and voting. As the nation reels from the effects of COVID-19, racial injustice, economic downturn, and voter suppression, it is our hope that tonight we can inform, engage, and excite you on issues about the importance of this election, the vote, and one of our community's most treasured institutions, historically Black colleges and universities, HBCUs. We have a phenomenal panel of young leaders who will help facilitate this discussion with thoughtful questions for our special guest tonight, Dr. Glenda Glover. But before I present Dr. Glover, let me introduce you to the outstanding panel joining us tonight. Now, HBCU Educated Black Women Vice Presidents. Hmm, that sounds like it has a nice ring to it, right? Our first panelist is Ms. Carrington Wiggum, Vice President of the Student Government Association at Florida A&M University. Welcome. Next, we have Ms. Sasha Wilson, the South Central Region Team President of Jack and Jill of America. Welcome, Sasha. Mr. Pearson Brooks, Senior Class President at the prestigious Green Hill High School in Dallas, Texas. We're excited to have you, Mr. Brooks, representing for all the young men out there tonight. Miss Peyton Bell Hunter is our next panelist. She is a senior at the Howard University. And our final panelist is Miss Erica Johnson, Miss Florida A&M University. Welcome our wonderful panel of student leaders who are participating in this conversation. And now for a very special guest, Dr. Glenda Glover, PhD, JD, and CPA. Of Nashville, Tennessee, Dr. Glover is the president of Tennessee State University, her alma mater. She is the institution's eighth and first woman president. She has more than 25 years of extensive academic and business leadership experience. And that experience has led to success as a member of several professional, civic, and nonprofit organizations, including the Lynx Incorporated. Dr. Glover is a recipient of numerous awards and honors and is also among an elite cadre of women who serve on corporate boards of publicly traded companies. And if that is not enough, Dr. Glover is also the international president and CEO of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Good evening, Dr. Glover, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Good evening. The topic of tonight's discussion is HBCUs and voting, and I can't think of a better opening question than one about last night's debate. Oh, if I could have only been a fly on the wall. <laughs> Now we, pun, we have, pun intended. Right, right, pun intended. Now we have the first time ever an HBCU graduate, a black woman, an Indian South Asian woman as a major party ticket candidate for the office of vice president of the United States of America. So let's talk about last night's debate. What, what did you think about it? Well, I thought that Senator Harris's performance was phenomenal. And her performance reflected the education and preparation that HPCUs are known for. So I, I expect her to perform at that level. So I thought she was excellent. Uh, the world had another opportunity to get to know the Senator Kamala Harris that so many of us have seen already and admire. So she was prepared, she was professional. She just commanded the stage. And so that's important because part of the debate is whether the vice president can do the job and has to show to the world that the vice president can do the job. And she showed them that she's capable and she's qualified. So I was, I was just thrilled and excited. Yes, I think so many of us were. And as a black woman in a position of leadership such as yourself, um, there's been a lot of talk on social media about how she had to uh, 
keep saying I'm speaking with a smile as she was interrupted. And then this morning, the president of the United States calling her a monster. So for young black women who aspire to positions of leadership like Senator Harris and yourself, uh, what are some things that they could do now to better prepare themselves when they have to encounter people like those who don't want to see them win? Well, she brings a, a level of inspiration and she's exciting. And she's smart and she's energetic and she shows that. And so it's, you know, she's inspirational to little black girls and little Indian girls and Asian girls. And so it's, it's a proud moment for women. It's a proud moment for young ladies, a proud moment for young men. Because if you can see it, you can be it. And so that's the pride that we, we have of what happened last time we see her. That's right. If you can see it, you can be it. <laughs> All right. So let's get to some of these panelists' questions who uh, I know they're excited to have this opportunity to speak with you. So our first question tonight comes from Ms. Carrington Wiggum. Hello, Dr. Glover, and thank you so much for being with us tonight. So my first question to you is, when you look at how history contextualizes the importance of our vote, what particular moment in history do you feel should always inspire us to remain civically engaged? Well, there is not a singular moment when we must, you know, we've, you know, there are things that we've done that have made this moment possible and, and, and special. We first got the right to vote. That was one of them. Uh, you know, when others marched for us to have this right. My father was a civil rights leader, and I, and I recall seeing him uh, be, being arrested just for registering people to vote um, in, in Memphis. And it's, it's, it's those types of moments that really inspired me to make sure that I would vote as early as I possibly could the moment I turned 18, and then uh, to see if we could make this world better for African Americans and others, and people of color. Uh, what was really striking one day is we sat there, uh, we, uh, that person's house down the street from me burned down because we lived in a county area of Memphis. It wasn't in the city limits yet, and the fire department could not assist because it was the racial climate of that day didn't allow it. And so my dad, my father led a march to get sewers and, and fire protection in our part of Memphis. So I vowed then, as soon as I become of age, I'm going to run for mayor of Memphis <laughs> and change things. <laughs> of course, I didn't do that. But I think it was moments like that when you watch the racism and you see what's happening as you're growing up and you just make a vow to yourself that at some point, you're gonna make a difference, you're gonna make it happen. That was great. Thank you for sharing uh, that story. Um, that was one I don't think I knew. So. <laughs> well, you know a lot of my stories. I think you turn your ear sometimes. <laughs> I do. Uh, all right, from our next question comes from a panelist representing a university that we both have a very special affinity for, Howard University. Uh, so Peyton Bell Hunter, the floor is yours. Good evening, Dr. Glover, and thank you for joining us. Um, my first question is, although most college students are eligible to vote, college students are confused about the voting process as it refers to absentee voting in our county versus where your college is located. Would you please clarify the process for students that are away from home? Oh, okay. For students, you, you vote where you're registered. If you are registered at home, it's best to vote at your home location. If you're resident at school, go to school location. I mean, this year, for this election, it's especially important to have the documentation, the documents that match. The, the documentation has to, to coincide. We can't have an address. If you live, it's a year from Howard. You're Howard. So yes, you live, I'm in okay, Howard. And you're from, what's your hometown? Where are you from? Dallas, Texas. So you're from Dallas, and you go to Howard. If you got a Texas... Uh, a driver's license, and then uh, you go to Howard to vote, they won't let you do it. Right. Because, I mean, there are some times, in some cases, well, not this election, there may be some possibility. But for this election, you, if you're at your university, you vote at school, your address, home, I mean, it must be the same. So, I'm saying. so you, it's best to vote absentee if you have a different address, voting address from the license. And I can't overstress that. That's the first thing they're going to check to make sure you're on the roll 
with the right address. So look at your driver's license, look at the address on the voter roll, they must match. There are no exceptions. So, in, so and young people will definitely determine the outcome of this election, just like they did in 2008 when Obama, President Obama won. So we're asking young people to make sure you check early now to make sure that your voting credentials are intact. Because so you can get a provisional ballot, but all of them don't get counted. So let's make sure that if, you, if you're registered in Texas, that you get an absentee ballot in Texas and vote. If you're registered at Howard in D.C., then vote there. Yeah, that's great information and very crucial at this time. So our next <laughs> question comes from Mr. Pearson Brooks. Again, he is the senior class president at the prestigious Green Hill School located in Dallas, Texas. So Mr. Brooks. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Glover. Hello. So uh, there are many statistics that say a lot of the American people actually do not vote, even though lots of people have given their time, their efforts, and their lives to uh, our right to vote. So my question is, how do you think that HBCUs or any college or university can encourage voting in their communities? Well, there are various things that HB HBCUs do. Um, I, I'll tell you in both of my positions, as president of Alpha Kappa Alpha, we have a, we have a mandate that every HBCU campus, where there's a chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha, that you must have some type of voter engagement, whether it's um, uh, voter education, voter registration, voter mobilization, you must do something that pertains to voting, voter engagement. And then at Tennessee State, where I serve as president, we have uh, the getting people to the polls, the voter mobilization effort, uh, sold to the polls. So we have students, and, and so we are partnering with Uber to assist in getting people to the polls. We also have them helping the older individuals, well, they don't have to be older, but in this case just happened to be, to double check the roles the voting roll to make sure your name is on the roll. Because you know, sometimes they go through and purge rolls and say they want to clean them up because people die and whatever, or move out or whatever, whatever. But because this election is so critical, we're not taking any chances. We're making sure that everybody is working at their maximum capacity to get people to, out to the polls to vote. And that's what we're doing now. Asking to vote early. Um, I think it opens in, in Tennessee, where I am, next week on the 14th. Um, somebody said Jackson. I don't think it opens it. I don't think Jackson is early voting. But you know, there are the early voting dates. We got a chart of all the early voting dates that we got to publish. So everybody knows where state and when they can go and vote, because that's what's so critical. So vote, make sure you, just, you can vote absentee ballot, you can vote in person early, you can vote on election day. So that's what we do. All right. Good information, and as we mentioned, every vote counts. Okay. Every vote counts. That's right. And our next question is going to come from uh, Miss Sasha Wilson, who's a high school senior, and she is the team president of the South Central Region of Jack and Jill. Sasha, I've heard, I've heard of Sasha. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't love her. <laughs> Hello, Sasha. Um, I know HBCUs have a rich legacy of activism. How do you encourage voter registration with the students on your campus and how politically active are they? Well, that's kind of the same thing we were saying. We're asking the students on our campus to do something. They can't just sit by and watch and say like last night they had watch parties, virtual parties. Because of campus, is, because of COVID, you know, we can't do a lot of things. They really wanted to assemble in the student union center, but we just couldn't let that happen because it, the risk is just too great. So they had some watch party the debate. So we had them to, for extra credit, to take notes and do things. All of them didn't do it, but for some of them, they could get extra credit for doing some things and, and make a note of some of the points that were made and some of them could fact check. So it was kind of a fun thing. And needless, and, and as soon as the hair was coming out way ahead, you know. <laughs> yes. That is wonderful. And Miss Florida A&M University, Erica Johnson, has our next question. Yes, ma'am. Congratulations. Thank you. 
Thank you. My question is, if there is still a group of young people out there stating that they're not going to vote because their vote will not count, what could be said to help them understand how the decision not to vote could be a pivoting moment on their future? So there, if the students are saying they're not going to vote, that's I mean, those things you really hate to hear about that. Um, when students say they're not going to vote, it's important because of, of what happened to make you get the right to vote. Separate things had to happen for that. I mentioned about my father getting arrested for registering party vote. You've heard the stories about what has happened to those who just trying to register to vote. I do. I spent a lot of time in Jackson, Mississippi. And you know, Mrs. Merrill Evans is one of my friends. Her husband got killed because he was registering people to vote. So the price that was paid is just too great. So your parents, your grandparents, and, and those uh, you know who who in your family who are of age, you know, they 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 participated in making this right to vote possible. Your vote is your voice. So you're actually president. Wait. Let's see. Which one you are the? I'm Miss Famu. Miss Famu. Okay, I was thinking you were Miss Famu. I, mean, I thought you were Miss you Fresh. You're Miss Famu. Okay, so every vote was counted in your election when you were elected, whether it was a small margin or a large margin. Every vote was important. So if everyone had the, everyone thought that maybe my one vote doesn't count, where would everybody be? I mean, look at the elections where a handful of votes. Have, have cost the election, what have, have turned the election. The difference between, the difference with just astonished people, if just to quote a few numbers, in the 2016 election, the state of Michigan was lost by a Democratic Party by less than 11,000 votes out of, that sounds like a lot of votes, but we look at the, the millions that vote in, in, in Michigan, and then 300,000 in Detroit alone didn't vote. So that, that, that cost a whole, all the electoral votes of Michigan went into the other, another party, the other party. So another thing, if your vote doesn't count, why do you think they work so hard to suppress it? So, so somebody knows their vote counts. So your vote is your voice. And if you don't vote, you know, there is no do over. So voting is just too fundamental. Those are all great points. And then, you know, for the young people, decisions being made now are going to affect you much more than they affect us when you look it at the affect, climate change. Affect how much you pay for tuition, <laughs> whether right. or not your school gets funded. So all these things, will, they affect every, every, almost every aspect of life is what, I mean, that's the effect it's going to have from voting guys. Yes. Yeah, so too important not to believe your vote will not count. Yes. And uh, I think this is a good time to transition since we have the two topics that we are uh, discussing tonight, your vote, and then also our HBCUs, which we know are critically important and have been discussed in great deal uh, by both candidates uh, in terms of what they plan to do to support HBCUs. And our panelists have some great questions as well. So I'm going to start this time with Ms. Sasha Wilson. If you go ahead with your question. I want to attend an HBCU, but for other high school students like me who are finalizing where they want to go to college, what would you say to them about how HBCUs better prepare students for success, especially in this political climate we are in? Yeah. You go to an HBCU for one reason and one reason only, that is to get a quality education. There's some other benefits, you know, the band, homecoming, there's, there's, there's no other homecoming like an HBCU homecoming. So we, we can concede that. There's just no other, there's no other homecoming. So there, so all those things you go, but you go to get a quality education so that you can be competitive and you can stand up against anybody. You, know, you, you look at some of the role models, Kamala Harris and Thurgood Marshall and Oprah Winfrey, and Felicia Rashad, and you know, what's this guy uh, who's been to cell phone, all the NFL players. And there's just nothing like the black intelligentsia, you know, the, the intelligent black person. There's just nothing like that. And so in you know, HBCUs, you can just be proud of your blackness. You know, there are good times, like I said, but you know, you can just be smart without having to justify why you're there. People don't assume you shouldn't be there. They're glad that you are. They're just glad you're there. 
you can just you can just blossom. You got the help and the assistance from people who look like you and want to want you to succeed. So it's so that's the reason you want to go to HBCU. You want that quality education, and you want the education to make you competitive. And then while you're there, you're gonna grow, you're gonna blossom, and you're gonna have your mentors, you're gonna see people who look like you who are really pushing you and, and forced you to succeed. Sometimes you don't even want to, but you gotta succeed anyway. And then, so that's what you find in HBCU. And uh, so you just, it's a pride of, of ownership. I, I never thought about going anywhere else. And I got accepted into some of the best schools in the country. I made up my mind, I was going to HBCU first. And then I said, I'm, I, have to go. And I went to the campus. And I, once I visited Tennessee State, I saw the campus and I, I, I said, I'm, I didn't I want to go back home that weekend. I was ready to just go right then. I had to finish high school first. So, <laughs> so that's my answer to you, Sancho. That's great. And as you were talking, I see Carrington and Peyton and Erica all nodding their heads in agreement. <laughs> Of course, they're all attending HBCUs right now, and they are excited and 100% behind everything that you said. So that was great. And you like just being, you like being smart and being intelligent, and no one is questioning, you know, you don't walk past a group of people and say, you know, she's here because of affirmative action. That doesn't happen at HBCU. You're there because you're good. You finish high school with all the good GPA, and you get all these scholarships at different places, and you chose an HBCU. I mean, that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Yes, love that, love that. All right, and uh, Erica, our Miss Florida a and University, the next question is yours. My question is, as a senior at an HBCU, I have heard from my friends who are recent HBCU graduate state that they are being overlooked for key jobs because they graduated from an HBCU rather than a PWI, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. What advice would you give to an HBCU student and graduates? Well, Eric, I have to tell you, the facts don't really support that. And you can always point out one or two that may have had some experiences like that. Um, because if, if you're good, you know, it's going to shine. It's going to shine through. If, you, if you're mediocre, you can be a PWI or HBCU, it won't matter. You're not going to be the first to get the job. So, but, but one thing about when they go to recruit students at PWIs, they're not necessarily looking for and African-American students. But if you, if you stand out, of course, you'd be selected. Um, but when they go to HBCUs, they're looking for a top right student. And some of them will have GPAs that they're looking for a three, five and above. Some will be looking for somebody with a three point. Or some looking, there are some who you have two, seven, two, eights. So they, for, for, for good spirit, good attitude, you worked hard. So, but the key thing is, you get yourself, you, know, you get a job yourself. The resume gets you the interview, but the interview gets you the job. So the resume, if you can have a resume such that they would look at it and say, well, I like this person. This person has, eh, doesn't have a four points, they have a three, three, two, but they're, they're so active in the community and they're so well-rounded. I really like this person. And you, because I know I've had to make decisions. Um, when I, in the, I'm in the corporate world too, sitting on corporate boards with to make decisions about which student, which person. And gladly we take the involved students over the high GPAs. High GPA is important, but a student with a high GPA and involvement, that's what they look for. So if you can stay active on the campus in the community, if you know, if you you're in a sorority or fraternity, I mean if you're looking at that, I mean it's just so much you can do to just just to keep yourself uh, active and engaged because that's what employers like to see. Hmm. That's great. And speaking of active and engaged, Madam Vice President, Karen <laughs> uh, the next question is yours. Okay, so my question is, we all know that there are some African American students still prioritizing PWIs over HBCUs, but in reality, HBCUs hold weight for social and emotional progression for black students. So my question is, how do we truly instill the mindset of Afri to African-American children that HBCUs are where our talent should be and where our education should come from? Good, thank you. Well, it's not about social progression. You're absolutely right. I mean, that's, that's kind of the thought processes in quite a few people. It's not necessarily about social progression. 
It's about a quality education. Again, remember, you go to HBCU for the reason of getting a quality education and being competitive. Yes, they're a good time. That's just part of it. That's not why you go to HBCUs. But in, in the end, you must determine what is best for you. The HBCUs may not be for everybody, just like PWI is not for everybody. You know, going to HBCU, you should determine what are you, what are you looking for. You first start with whether you're going to determine HBCU or not. You want to decide what are your career goals. This is how you select a school. Then your major. You want to be a nurse. And this school has a good nursing department. You might want to look at that a little further, a little more carefully. Or if you see, if you want to be a nurse and they don't have a, a, a nursing department, you know that's not the school for you, unless you want to just go to health science overall or think about something else or going to uh, having a dual enrollment. So there are ways you can still do it, but you decide your career goals first. And then just look at, determine whether you want to be at a big, a large school, a small school. The HBCUs are in urban areas. And they're in the country, you know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, so what do you want? You know, you want to go to, um, you want a great band, you know, then, then of course you have to come to Tennessee State for that. You know, <laughs> if you want a great band, or if you want to be an AKA or a Delta or a Zeta or a Sigma, if you, want, if you want Greek life, that's one thing. You want to go to a Catholic school or a Methodist school or state school. So you got to kind of start making your, the choices. And, you know, what is it that you're really looking for in a university? You know, which one meets your need the best? Uh, you know, which one? Then just let, narrow it down to about five or so and then start. That's when you start really being serious about which one you want to choose. But, but you know, that, that's my, that, that's how I, I would suggest you, to, you tell your friends and they do when they start talking about it. You, know, you want to look at the competition, the, the how you, how competitive you want to be when you graduate. You know, can you walk when you walk up that stage like Kamala Harris from Howard and go to law school, then go and start start your climb because all of you already started your climb and you're going to do great things. So you have to make sure you get that ground, that right grounding, and have the right foundation, the fundamentals, because you can never go back and pick those up. You know, get those fundamentals so when you, as you climb, and you will climb, that you just, you, you get it now. So you don't have time to go back and pick up, you know, how to conjugate a verb or what's that. You don't have time for that once you start, once you start your real political life, your social life, your academic life. That was great. I, I know you tried to be diplomatic at first when you said <laughs> consider both, but it sounds like every box that you said there is an HBCU <laughs> every single one of the criteria that you have and we there know is. you a product of an hbcu are one of like one i don't know uh women in the world with the jd <laughs> cpa mba as my husband likes to say everything but the md and you probably <laughs> could have had that by now too if you wanted to well so, now i've learned enough about covid from from learning the stuff <laughs> on campus i could probably come and say yes <laughs> anyways no but right. you know, okay. I didn't always set out to to have a lot of degrees, but I always chose this path of least resistance, the path that wasn't so crowded. When I got to Tennessee State, I wasn't sure what I was going to major. I thought I wanted to be a teacher and teach mathematics. I did major in math, but not for that reason. I wanted to know what is the hardest major on campus. And people they said physics, engineering, math, accounting. So I just kind of went to the library and researched them. And math seemed to be the hardest. So I chose math. <laughs> Nutty, but I chose math. And then as I was about to graduate in my senior year, I was saying, well, I'm not sure if I'm going to go to law school, med school, or what. And so I said, which exam is the hardest exam to pass? And the med medical school exam was hard. The bar was hard. And the CPA had the lowest pass rate. So I said, I want to be a CPA. <laughs> so because there were not many black women. See, one thing I've learned, if you, enter, if you learn at the same level as everybody else, then you haven't, you, you, you're not any more competitive than anybody else. But if you learn at a higher level, that puts you a notch ahead of everybody else. So I said, I'll be a CPA. Nobody's passing the exam. So I'm going to show them how to do it. <laughs> well, it was the hardest exam I've ever taken, the biggest feat. <laughs> I mean, it was, so I didn't pass it the first time or the second time. But I buckled down and I passed it. 
And then I said, well, I'm going to show others how to do this because you can't go with the attitude that you're smart. You're smart than everybody else because everybody in the world is taking it. Well, not everybody in the world, but everybody's taking it. So, but my point is, go, choose the areas, even if you're in college now or about to go to college or whatever, choose the areas that's not going to have the most competition because I knew that the competition, uh, I like competition, but you want to get above the competition. Have the people, you want to be a step above. You want to help choose. If you got five people competing, you want to be one of the ones that's choosing the right one out of that. You don't want to be one of the five competing. <laughs> so, so, so that's how I was in my theory. Get that pathway that not many people are on and try to get others to, to join you. You know, once you get over there, like you, 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 know, you miss family, you're the SGA president. So now you want to start showing others, how can, here's a, I want to do something, I want to show students how they can win elections. You know, first count your votes. Here are my yeses, here are my noes, here are my maybes. Let me go after the maybes. So learn, show others how to do it. Because if, you, if you've succeeded and you brought nobody with you, you've accomplished precisely nothing. So you want to make sure you are broad enough to help others as you're climbing your ladder of success. Yes, that's awesome. And Madam Vice President, you know, as a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, throwing that in there, she knows the importance of giving back and helping others. So she that's right. There will be some to follow behind her, VP and President and everything else, right? <laughs> and, and, and you said giving back, but just make sure you give back to your, your, your HBCUs. Once you graduate, just give back because they need you. The proudest moment, one of my proudest moments, my son went to Morehouse. My son called me. He said, I just made, I made a contribution to Morehouse. I said, you did? He said, they need, you said they need the money. So I made a contribution. So I called my pastor. I said, you know, we finally got through. I was telling my friends, I said, how much you give me? So I gave him $100. I was just so excited because he got it. But fast forward three weeks. I get my American Express bill. He put it on my, he gave to Morehouse on my American Express bill. I said, you think I gave, if I already give him more house, $84,000 for four years. I'm not giving him anything else. <laughs> well, he gave, he gave. <laughs> my point is, start giving back. Join your pre-alumni association, start giving back. Right, that very important point. And uh, next, let's see, Mr. Brooks, he's been waiting there so patiently, speaking of presidential, <laughs> Again, you know, Green Hill, a very prestigious uh, private school here in Dallas, Texas. So very excited yes. to see him as the senior class president. And I know you have a question that you are ready and excited to ask. Yes, thank you, moder Moderator Wilson. Uh, I'm speaking from the perspective of a senior who's about to send their applications and I think Right now, during, during COVID, a lot of seniors are not able to visit the colleges that they want to get a feel for the student life, the activities that are going on on campus. So what do you suggest for students in my position who are not able to get an idea of the community that we always hear about HBCUs? You know, it's unfortunate this the time period it is, but the best we have to do now is do it virtually. You know, your, your world lives in a virtual world anyway. You stay in front of the laptop and cell phones all day. But now extend that to the education, just take the virtual tours. You know, this is the high, at Tennessee State, this is the highest freshman class we've ever had. And I never met any of them. You know, usually I meet them when they come to campus, but I never had a chance to meet anybody, you know, as if it's virtually, but you know, this is, it's, it's not the usual time that it's going to pass. It will pass. But do the virtual visits, stay in touch with, with the schools. And, you know, as you, you go back over what we said earlier, pick out what you want to do, what you, you know, what you think long term, what you want to do. You may not know precisely, you may have a thought, may have an idea now, because it changes your first year, second year. Things will change in your mind. Yours may not, but some students do, they change their mind. I want to do something. You start off wanting to be an engineer, uh, or may, may end up a social worker. You start off wanting to be an art major, may end up in math. So you, it just depends. But look at and, and one big factor is going to be finances. Look at who gives you the money. 
sometimes you get more money, you get more money than other school, the school is not, you know, not your primary choice. Um, but you end up going there because your parents, you don't want to put your parents in the hardest financial strain. You don't want to put yourself in all the student loan debt. Because there, there's money for college students. You got good GPAs, you can usually get scholarships. But scholarships don't last always. Sometimes they run out because it's just not enough to go around. So you look and see how much money you can get. And try to determine, do you want to go to an HBCU? Do you want to go to a PWI? Or it doesn't matter. So make your three columns and see which one's going to give you, look at the money, look at the, what you think of the school, the reputation, um, do they have your major? Can you look at what the, the graduates are doing? Like I have, we have students who come to Tennessee State and major communications. Guess why? Because Oprah Winfrey went to Tennessee State. <laughs> and they said she's doing, she's doing so well, they want to be like Oprah. And so one person said, well, I want to major in math. That's why I came to TSU. And so I said, well, I'm so impressed. I was about to get impressed myself. I, I said, well, who, who inspired you? They said, well, she, and I said, oh, yeah, she's talking about me. And I said, well, who are you? She said, oh, Miss Goodlow. I said, who? I, th I thought you were talking about me. As the math major inspired you. They said, well, you too. I said, oh, no, no, I just, it's too late now, you know. <laughs> so, but somebody inspired them. And so, you know, sometimes your family members and others who, you, who will assist you in making your choice. You have parents who, my population at TSU, and TSU in this case means Tennessee State University, um, don't have a lot, I mean, about maybe one third of them may have parents who can sit down with them and talk to them about college and help them make decisions. But for the most part, it's the high school counselors that will, that will be very, very important in your life. And you still feel free to ask them questions, your, your faculty, your teachers, and the principal, because they'll be able to help you and guide you. But try to get a lot of scholarships so that you can, <laughs> so you can get into any in school you want to. Because I've learned from being commencement speakers, and I sit there and listen to all these scholarships that students are getting, $5 million in scholarships around the country, and $8 million in scholarships around the country. And that's a big thing for them at graduation. And so, but and then, then they sit back and look and say, well, I'm going to see which one gives me the, what I want to do with my life. And so that's how, and that's the best way to do it. Great information, great information. And our final question from our panelists this evening is from Ms. Peyton Bell Hunter. So Peyton, go ahead and ask your question to Dr. Glover. Hello again. As a senior, it can be nerve wracking to be now thrown into the workplace environment. After graduation, how are HBCUs preparing students differently from PWIs to be ready to be a great worker, a great person, contribute to their team better than and be competitive in the work environment? Well, we were saying different, right? It's not so, it's not so different right now. Uh, we, I know the climate appears to be different because of COVID, but we're still fighting those same battles. We've been fighting all along, you know, since they were since they were found in racism, unequal funding, unequal treatment, having to prove ourselves. So we've had to step up. You know, there's some things that HBCUs we've had to do. We had to step up our technology infrastructure. When we're about to go online, we to make sure we could compete and go on. Remember, you're there to, to get a quality education, there to be competitive. We had to make sure that we, nobody's education was compromised. So we to get the you know, step up the infrastructure. But the pandemic has revealed what we've already known, that we've had even COVID itself. It's not because they say African Americans have high blood pressure and have diabetes and they're so successful. That's not it. That may be a, a, a factor, but the real factor is because of the, the discrimination that's taken place for so long in the healthcare system and it pertains to people of color, that now it's coming home to roost. Now, yes, the high blood pressure is there, but why? It's because there was improper healthcare from the beginning. There was no, you know, there, the treatment wasn't there. You didn't have the money to take care of things. And that was just, it was just an unfair treatment that has just made this come to light. So if COVID has done anything, it's shown us how, how people of color in various aspects of life business and as we talk about HBCUs, that it shows how inadequate funding can really help, really hurt. But what makes HBCUs so special is this. We took what little we had and produced 
some of the greatest people that ever lived, that the world has ever known, the doctors, the lawyers, the CPAs, the, the politicians, the philanthropists, the business leaders, the scientists, the mathematicians, you know, the teachers, you name it. So the HBCUs have produced them. So, so we're the descendants of kings and queens, and we're proud of who we are. You know, the royalty. I mean, we built those pyramids in Egypt. You know, we made them. So that's our that's who we are. That's our background. That's who we are. So it's always important for us to know our history because if not, people can tell you anything and then they can define you. When you are God's creation, God has defined your destiny and he will lead you directly into your destiny. So know who we are. Know why we're at HBCUs because we are royal. We know who we are. We know that God has designed us to be who we want to be. Ooh. I almost felt like I should say pass the offering collection, but I know whenever you're around, those words should never be said because we will end up raising another million dollars. <laughs> so pretend like I didn't say that. Uh, so those, those nuggets right there are nuggets that you will only get as an HBCU student, and they are empowering in words that soak in your spirit and, and allow you to be in positions from an HBCU student to president of that campus, to a vice yes. presidential candidate of the United States. So we, and we are so excited. This has been Hi. such a discussion tonight. And Dr. Glover, uh, I'm gonna allow you to offer some closing remarks if you would like. Well, let me tell you, this has been great. I just enjoyed, I'm always happy when I can talk to students. <laughs> so, but thank you for this, uh, this opportunity. I um, thank the, the president. Um, I want to also just say a word or two to Ms. Ms. Vivian because it was just just a moment before I get to well to Miss um, to Tracy Tracy um, this Madam President and to Vivian Johnson who I think was chair of the program tonight to you uh, Miss Wilson you've just been a wonderful host and a wonderful moderator thank you so much. And to all the students, you're just, just where you look happy and excited. So it's, it's always good. And uh, these are my two favorite topics, um, the HBCUs and, and voting. So I thank the Lynx. I thank the Lynx organization, especially, you know, this Fairbairn County for inviting me. Because the importance, of, the importance of voting just cannot be overlooked and, and the problem of HBCUs can't be overlooked. So this has been a wonderful opportunity. It's always a joy to have conversation with young people. So I tell you, just keep studying, keep working, stay in prayer, and God will help you direct your destiny. Yes, yes. All those words, all of those words. And, and I too, like you, I'm energized and excited about this wonderful panel. Got to spend a little time with them yes. last night. And then again, this evening, and it just does my heart well, as I know it does yours, to know that uh, our future is in such good hands, and I'm so excited to see what the world has in store for them and what they have in store for the world. So behalf, on behalf of the Greater Denton County uh, chapter of the Lynx Incorporated, our president, Tracy Madison, the chair of this uh, panel tonight, Dr. Vivian Johnson, we thank you again, Dr. Glover, for taking time out of what I know is a very, very busy schedule, especially uh, post-debate <laughs> night, <laughs> that you are uh, in high demand, so we appreciate you taking this time. Again, thank you to the panelists. I know some of them rushed out of class uh, <laughs> to be on with us, so we appreciate uh, you for that. And to all of you who've joined us this evening, uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Uh, took a few notes to take away the importance of making sure, especially for our college students, that you check your voting uh, registration location so that you don't show up at the wrong place uh, on or prior to election day. Make sure you vote early and don't just vote alone. And then support HBCUs. There are many HBCUs uh, out there. Of course, I'm sure everyone on the panel has their favorite one and they would love to talk about that uh, at a later date, I'm sure. Uh, so I thought you were... Uh, <laughs> Wiggum was about to do her Rattler sign out there as, <laughs> as a little code. Um, <laughs> also, all of the alumni, be sure and give back to our organizations. Uh, they definitely need us now more than ever. 
And uh, we are going to close tonight with a performance from, trying to make sure no one is sending me uh, something else. Okay, uh, a performance from uh, Miss Fam Yu. We are excited that she is on here and, you know, uh, the Greater Dean County Chapter is sponsoring this panel, so I have to put a plug in to say all of the panelists are Aerolinks, or they are the children of members of the Links Incorporated. So okay. uh, it's not like they probably had a choice, but they represented so well, and we're excited to have them. So again, thank you, everyone, and we are going to end this panel uh, with a performance of the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing by Miss Erica Johnson, Miss Florida A&M University. Yay! <laughs> Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmonies of liberty Let our rejoicing rise High as the listening skies let it resound loud as the rolling sea sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us sing a song Full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun, have a new day begun. Let us march on till victory is won. Stony the road we trod, hit of the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died, yet with a steady beat, have not our weary Come to the place for which our Father sighed. We have come over a way that tears have been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughter. Uttered. Out from the gloomy past Till now we stand at last Where the white gleam of our bright star is cast God of our weary God of our silent tears, Thou who has brought us thus far all the way, Thou who has by Thy might led us into the light, keep us forever. In the path we play, lest our feet stray 
from the places, our God, where we met thee. Lest our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Shadow beneath thy heart, may we forever start true to our God, true to our Thank you.